Hi, my name is Saida Agostini Bostic. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm from Funders for LGBTQ Issues. We want to thank Women's Funders Network for creating this space for us today to have this really important conversation. This is really a kitchen table talk, right? We're convening some of the leading philanthropic organizers and movement builders to talk not just about the urgency of this moment, um, for all of the reasons that we know, but talk about what funders can do in this moment to show up. Here's what we know. Roe v. Wade is repealed. Radical ideological conservatism has banned the teaching of histories of people of color, LGBTQ folks, particularly TGNC folks, and drag performers are being criminalized for simply existing. Yet funding is not in any way commensurate with need. Funders for LGBTQ Issues puts out a tracking report measuring the scale and scope of LGBTQ philanthropy every year. Our most recent report found that in 2021, out of for every 100 philanthropic dollars spent domestically, only four cents goes to trans and gender nonconforming communities. And then in addition to that, funding for LGBTQ communities writ large remains at 24 cents out of every $100. So this is a crisis and this is a moment where we need to show up. So we're gonna go ahead and dive right in. So I would love to start with this question. What are you seeing and hearing on the ground from movement groups about how these attacks on gender, race, and reproductive rights are playing out in real time? What do funders need to know? And what are the wins that we are seeing? And I would actually really love to start with Emmett. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be uh, here with y'all. Uh, it's a great crowd. I feel a lot outnumbered, but, but it's all good. Um, you know, I, when I travel at this point, uh, I am describing a different reality than most people are living in. Uh, in Texas, we, we have a crisis on our hands that we see spreading throughout the nation. Um, on September 1st, uh, our trans medical care ban went into effect. Um, before that, we uh, essentially have become an organization that's trying to get families out of Texas uh, that are able to. Um, and that that's just a small part of that population. Uh, Texas is a home to the second largest trans population in this country. Uh, and I, I never thought I would be the call for parents telling me they've lost their kids, let alone having that call repeat itself. I never imagined that my work would be this. Uh, and when I try to explain to folks what is happening, what are the repercussions, even down to where we're looking at creating generations of trauma, um, not only from these kids, from these families, uh, but the siblings of these trans kids who are looking around and saying, my entire life is being uprooted. And it goes one of two ways. I blame my sibling, but the trans kids already blame themselves. In so many cases, we have parents who have had, had to split up. One parent goes to a safe state with the children. One parent stays in Texas because of the economic reality for that family. The other way that it goes with siblings is this deep mistrust and distrust of everyone. Because when you live in a state where you worry that the people who you're supposed to trust, your neighbors, your teachers, school counselor, everyone becomes a person that could potentially deeply harm your family even more than the state is doing. The reality for our community, as we saw in the Capitol earlier uh, this year, where there was no doubt that DPS had targeted brown trans folks. 
under the dome and brutalize them in front of media, in front of cameras, with no regard and no, no accountability still for slamming one of our community members onto the ground, causing a concussion that still has lingering effects today on the, them. And understanding that this happened in wide public view and as a community, we're looking around saying, this is wrong, period. And feeling like these cries are just going out into the abyss where people are like, that's so sad, that's so bad, and it stops there. Um, and so, you know, that is just kind of a drop in the ocean of the repercussions, unfortunately, uh, that I'm watching play out that every morning I wake up, it's there. Every night going to sleep, it is there. And the level of vigilance, the level of trauma to a community and the adult population that's struggling just to find some kind of parity. Uh, it, it is one of the most devastating atrocities I, that I continue to witness um, and see all the intersections of all the issues that we care about really be manifested uh, towards the people in our community that encapsulate those factors and who they are in their being and watching them then uh, present as, as sort of a epicenter target for the state sanctioned violence. Thank you. And um, so thank you, Emmett, and good morning, everyone. Okay, that was terrible. Can we try this again? Good morning, everyone. Okay, I know this work is hard, but if we're not using our rebellion through our joy, I don't know how we do it. So we're all friends here, we're all doing this work together. I'd like to talk a little bit about when I think about movement groups and funding. Um, I think it's important that we name, and what I'm hearing from movement groups, is that the restrictions and constraints of our own strategies should not be visited upon movement groups. Movement groups are operating in these spaces to fight back against everything that Emmett's named and more. And they have to be intersectional. They have to be in the way we work. And I think the, the challenge for us as funders is often we have very prescribed strategies and it's not uncommon to be like, oh, we, this is really important, but that's not quite what we do. Can we focus on repro not, not voting rights? Can we focus on this, not that? and not necessarily understanding how all this stuff sticks together. So I wanna talk a little bit about what authoritarian needs, authoritarianism needs to thrive when we talk about retrenchment of democracy. Targeting marginalized communities. Please note I did not say vulnerable, right? Communities are not vulnerable. They are intelligent collectives that know exactly what they need. When we think about solutions and you call a community vulnerable, you get really different solutions than if you call a community targeted and we're talking about marginalized, targeted communities. Corrupting elections, stoking violence, politicizing independent elections, spreading disinformation, aggrandizing executive power, quashing dissent through the press, um, closing civil space, um, and criminalizing protest, right? How are all these things not visited the first, the fastest, hardest and the most on the communities we're talking about here today. And the notion of how we think about funding this has got to be intersectional. We also have to think about global solidarity on this work, even if we're only working in a single country, even if we're only working in a single space, the groups and the movements are not. They're multinational, multilateral, and we have to acknowledge and recognize what's happening, right? Uganda is now putting the first person um, let me make sure I have this right because 
um, aggravated homosexuality carries a death penalty. And now there's a first person on trial being put to death for being gay in Uganda, right? When we think about the Western Balkans and what's happening there around repro and women's rights, from the time these countries were deeply communist, the question of reproductive rights and access to abortion had not changed until the last 10 years, right? When we think about what's going on in this country, criminalization of protests, all we, we don't have to go very far. Let's just look at Cop City, right? RICO charges against protesters that they're claiming are anarchists when their primary strategy is getting the issue to the ballot? How could that be anarchy? But literally interjecting around our democratic policies. So I think one of the things as we think about all of these issues and we think about what I'm hearing from our movement groups is we don't decide the work, they decide the work. And how do we, how do we think about how do we take accountability for our strategies? When we say how we're being effective, what is our impact? That's our job. It is not their job to define the impact and effectiveness. It is their job to do the work. And so I think the biggest challenge for us is to really start thinking about how do we, as we organize our strategic interventions, organize them in a way that allows for the reality of the fact that these intersecting strategies and tactics are burdened on the same communities over and over and over again, and that we do not hyper limit the ability to fund folks based on singular interventions or the notion of we have, we have a very narrow way of entering this, that we have to be more expansive in how we think about supporting movement groups. And that's what I'm hearing. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, that was, that was so powerful, both of you. Thank you, and thank you, Saida, for setting us up so beautifully. And thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be with all of you. Um, I'm really happy to be in this space, thank you. Um, I wanna build off what you all said a little bit. Um, I think what you made very clear is that the attacks that we are seeing right now need to be seen clearly as attacks on democracy itself. These are attacks on democracy. Attra attacks on trans kids in Texas are an attack on democracy. The reality is though, I think the funding communities are really, are, are not there yet. We haven't gotten where we need to be. Um, I just wanna share a quick story. I, I've spent most of my life working at the intersection of racial and gender justice and feminist philanthropy. And when I, two years ago, I came to the Democracy Alliance um, and was um, clearly going to be focused squarely on issues of democracy in the US with an understanding that this is, um, we need to have connections globally. But one of the things that I noticed um, as I talked to some of the funders from like my previous life, when I would tell them what I was, what I was doing, they said, oh, that's so good because I feel like I actually can't fund women and girls of color anymore because democracy is so important. And I was like, <laughs> I, this is real. I mean, yeah, you, you all know this is real. And I thought this is like a real problem that these linkages are not being made and the connections are not being made because what's very, very clear is the authoritarian right is making those connections. They are not confused at all, right? So we know this because we know that um, Putin, do you all remember when Putin gave a speech in the middle of a war and he took time out to criticize the West for being too mean, quote mean, to JK Rowling for her anti-trans comments, right? He, he did that, right, that happened. Um, we see in Hungary, they're you know, banning gender studies and then they move on to ban images of LGBT people. In Turkey, they're backing out of the Istanbul Convention on gender-based violence. You know, in Russia, they're trying to make um, domestic violence no longer a crime. Like, all of this stuff is all related. And then we just move here, right, where in nearly half the states, you can't get a legal abortion in this country, right? We know like 500 bills targeting LGBT people in this country, right? We know that. And we also know that that is all well-funded and it's super well-coordinated, right? The Global Philanthropy Project estimates that um, 
There is a billion dollars going from the US, flowing outside the US to fund anti-gender movements, to fund attacks on LGBT people, to fund, to fund attacks on women. That is what is happening, uh, more than a billion dollars. At the same time, you know, we know from really incredible groundbreaking research from the Black Feminist Fund that most black feminist organizations, more than half in fact, um, have less than $50,000 budget, right? More than half have no funds to carry them through the next fiscal year, right? This is like a huge, um, this is a huge disparity that we have to correct. And what we know is that the way we correct this is that we fund boldly and we fund for a long time and we fund the movements that are challenging the authoritarian right. Um, I'm really glad to be a part of Shake the Table where we called for an additional $6 billion of funding by 2026 to be spent specifically on feminist movements in the global south and feminist movements led by indigenous folks, black folks, and women of color in the global north. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we have to get there, right? We have to get there. This is gonna take all of us to get there, right? That was a call, and by the way, it's the floor, not the ceiling. That was a call, but it is gonna take all of our advocacy to get there. And what it's gonna take is it's gonna take folks to really understand that democracy um, and these attacks are completely intertwined and that the way we respond, the antidote to authoritarianism is movement and collective action. Thank you. Okay. So already I'm having what I'm calling like a Lil John moment where every time y'all speak, I'm like, yeah, but in my head, but I just felt called to share that. Um, you know, so one of the things that I think is really important to name that y'all I think have already done really well is the fact that essentially it feels like we're living an Octavia Butler novel, right? Like, I feel like I could have worn my shirt where it says Octavia tried to tell us. Um, and one of the things that really sticks with me is that if you look at Octavia Butler's work, there is always, yes, the frightening landscape of what's happening, but then there's also really powerful lessons that folks are metabolizing and internalizing and practicing. And so I think it's really important for us as part of this conversation to talk about the repeal of Roe versus Wade and to talk about what are the lessons that we need to take from that, because the reality is, is that movement have been warning that that would happen for decades, right? Um, and what is it we can take from that in order to move forward in our approach? And we are gonna start with Keisha. Well, I wanna have an Octavia Butler book club. That's what I want. That's what I want to talk about. But we're gonna we're gonna move. So um, it's hard to hear that and not get excited about like all the ways that I think that um, importantly as we talk. I'm diverging so quickly, but as we talk about futuring and futurism, I think the the lack of attention paid to Afrofuturism and how really those stories are really telling and help us define and shape a future, I just cannot encourage folks enough to really start thinking about that as an actual futuring discipline, not just a literary genre, and that there actually is, I think, some real deep and important connections within that space. Roby Wade. I think one of the biggest challenges of Roby Wade um, and I, I think Pamela can talk way more specifically, and so I'm going to defer to her, and I'm actually going to spend some time focused on the courts. And how um, our dependency upon the courts to protect has always existed for um, minority populations without a question. And now we find ourselves in this position where the courts are no longer the allies that many, many of our strategies have been deeply embedded around, particularly within the United States. And one of the challenges is we've always then, in turn, as progressive communities say, we have to rely on the rules. We have to rely on the rules. The rules are going to be what save us without necessarily really getting into who made the rules. Right? The rules are shaped to maintain power for a very specific group of people. When, that, when the rules no longer serve, the first and foremost rule is maintain that power. Right, 
as we talk about rules, changing rules, things like that, we always have to remember that every movement has been sustained by a certain population of people refusing to be governable, <laughs> deeply ungovernable. It is not everybody, it is not all the time, but these are the places we have to protect and really thinking creatively about what does it mean to look at the figurations and the configurations of our institutional our institutions within democracy, how do they serve us, how do they not? And are we listening again to movement groups saying, look, these spaces aren't serving us and not imposing top-down strategies that says, well, we just have to get the courts back. We have to get the courts back on our side. The courts were never on our side. The courts showed up in ways to maintain stability and power for democracy, and there is no modern democracy that has not been fully dependent on the exclusion of specific people to maintain their power. So as we think about Roe v. Wade, as we think about these strategies, I really think we have to really start examining these questions about dedication to rules, dedication to institutions, dedication to the shape of the space that we're seeking to contain and stop fighting for a seat at the table that would let us starve. I, I, that was your job, and I went to her. That was perfect. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. All of that. That is all of that. Um, I want to add three things, and one of them is completely related to what you just shared. What you just shared, Keisha. So first of all, I think one of the lessons we have to take from uh, the overturning of Roe versus Wade is we need to get political in our funding, right? We need to get political. <laughs> Last year, the largest single known donation for political advocacy in the US was $1.6 billion. Um, it was dropped last year for Leonard Leo from the Federalist Society. Um, who was the very architect of the court, right? The architect of the corrupt, undemocratic Supreme Court, right? Too often, I think, um, we fund in the 501c3 context, and, and we are not able to reach our goals unless we get political, because it's about power. It's about power. And we need to, we need to get in there and, um, and, and support more political, and do more political more, do more political funding, so that's first. Second, I think, is about the core rules of democracy, as Keisha said so um, beautifully. Like, they cannot win a fair fight. They cannot win a fair fight. They will not win, right? Like, they will not win. So they are rigging every rule. They are, they are building on the rules that have already been rigged for generations and rigging them further and further and further to their own ends. I mean, if, if folks are following what's happening in Ohio, right? Like, Ohio's a really great example, right? They explicitly tried to pass like a, a piece of democracy legislation to make it harder, right? To make it harder, to make it more undemocratic for folks to get something in the state constitution in Ohio. They failed miserably, right? They failed because we outorganized them. <laughs> Man, many people in this room, I'm sure, many people in this room outorganized them. Right, but they were very explicit. Like that is what they need to do to stop abortion rights from happening in this country because the reality is the majority of folks in this country are with us. Right, the majority of folks in this country are with us on abortion rights. And this is like, they, they will not win a fair fight. So we have got to go and move to unrig all of the rules, all of the rules that have been rigged for generations. And that leads to my third point, which is about, these are not quick. <laughs> None of this is gonna be quick, right? The rules of democracy, which are so rigged, the electoral, starting with the Electoral College, starting with DC not having statehood, those rules, right, those are rigged rules, but we can't be short-sighted, right? They spent 50 years trying to under, undo Roe, 50 years, 50 years. They, were, they weren't deterred, they lost so many times, so many times, but they continued and they continued. And so when we think from like two-year cycles or four-year cycles, and then we give up, Right, we, we seed, we seed ground to them. So it's, it's about the long game and it's really about a long-term progressive agenda um, that we stick with it. One of the things I, I try to really relate to folks is that trans folks were the canaries in the coal mine 
when it comes to democracy. Uh, even when we look at things like Texas with our voter ID laws of what does that mean for all of us, but understanding that trans folks were already saying, there's a problem with like how this works. Because when I go to cast my ballot, many times, uh, you know, I'm turned away. And so also for us to understand, if somebody's turned away at that point, what is the likelihood that they will become a lifetime voter? So what does that look like for us? In Harris County, where I live, uh, Houston, if anybody's from, no, okay. <laughs> Rough crowd. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we saw um, some really great changes happen uh, with opening uh, voting uh, stations 24 hours because we understand that uh, folks don't just work a nine to five shift. Uh, when you think about what are the things that you need to do, do you wanna take your kids to vote, maybe potentially stand in the line, try to chase them around, try to get them out of other people's ballots, you know, all of that. Uh, and, and different things, transportation, all of those things were really put into how we understood uh, on the county level and then what was the backlash immediately. Uh, from our state legislature was we have to shut this down. Um, when we look at, you know, how have trans folks been able to engage in any, any sort of way uh, when, when it comes to democracy, when we look at Roe v. Wade, uh, <laughs> for my community, it was, it's already almost impossible uh, for me, I, I was sexually assaulted the summer before my senior year. Consequential, like, I, I have a kid, which is like the joy of my life. They are everything I think uh, that was potentially maybe good in me embodied. And I'm, you know, but at the same time, understanding in that situation, uh, the first responder that my school called was a crisis pregnancy center. So what does that really look like? In Texas, uh, we saw our uh, clinics first reduced in a state the size of ours to a handful, maybe a half a handful from the handful that we had. Uh, when we look at even the process <laughs> of getting you know, somebody that looks like me uh, into that care, there's also all of these other roadblocks. So for us, was it was already like, yes, and it's not enough because this is the state. And so in, in so many ways, uh, that's really why I come back to try to like really meet people where they're at and make the connection because it's there. It's just, if I don't have that experience in my life, uh, then how am I gonna understand until somebody uh, takes that time and meets me where I'm at and makes that connection uh, and, and goes forward with me? And so, uh, you know, in, in so many cases, uh, in terms of the backlash, in terms of um, democracy, in terms of just understanding all of these hurdles, the challenges that are now, I think, being enlightened for uh, the general population that for us, <laughs> this was already our reality. Uh, and in a lot of ways, right, even though it, I, I don't want you all to think it's all dire doom and gloom, but where I see a huge opportunity that we really haven't taken advantage of is really deep collaboration with women's movements, with really understanding in terms of like, I don't know what's more feminist than saying, I have agency over myself and I should have the ability to be exactly as I know myself to be in every way of authenticity.
and really putting our foot down and saying, I'll be damned if you try to take that away from me. I'll be damned if I see, you know, women being like continued to be relegated to second class citizens. And so really looking at this huge opportunity, I think that we see for uh, more creativity, solidarity, and really what does it look like to compound our power and move forward. Um, I've been given a little bit of liberty, so I'll speak quickly. Um, to stitch together a couple of these comments, I think there's two really important points that were made, um, which is we have to get political. Um, and by the way, political isn't partisan. Partisan is partisan, political is political, and almost everything we do in life is political. We can fund it. Like, let's be really real about what is political. We can fund it. And I think the other piece is the sense of urgency with the recognition that a lot of, of, a lot of change is slow. Conservatives had the benefit of being slow because they wanted to maintain the status quo as their overall strategy. We have some urgencies now that look really different than when a lot of these campaigns started. And so as we think about the environment, as we think about the attacks on trans folks, as we think about these questions, we have to think about with our strategies, I am not suggesting on any level that long-term general support is not a good idea. Don't hear me say that on any level. What I am saying is we have some amazing intermediaries out there, many led by BIPOC folks, by queer folks, that can do rapid response funding, that can address urgent needs, that have to be funded to address the baseline work that impacts the lived experiences of people's lives while we are thinking about these large scale infrastructure tectonic shifts related to our infrastructure, our technology, and the other, the other issues that are going to continue to be long term. But I do think it's incredibly important that we continue to think about what are the interventions that must be made because there is urgency in the environment we live in today. We are in the face of crisis and people are being hurt and we do have to think about how our funding strategies connect to that as well. So I'm now resisting the urge to do an Usher moment and be like, yeah, but I'm gonna save that. Um, so I'm gonna take a little bit of moderator privilege. We're gonna skip <laughs> the third question because I actually want us to get into this final piece. Normally I feel like sometimes when we go to a panel, we like hear a bunch of things and we're like, yeah, and then we walk away, right? And that's it, that's, that's the period. And I think for all of us here, we want this to be a comma um, for the English grammar nerds in the room. And so, you know, what I would love to hear from each of y'all as we close out is what is the invitation? What is the call that you're offering to folks here in this room? And we're going to start with Pamela this time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so much that has already been said, but I'll just very quickly just to, to say again, one is, I think it is about connecting the dots, right? These issues are all interrelated and we will not be able to win, right? To win in the immediate and the long term unless we are working together. And I really appreciated your call that this is like actually a moment of enormous opportunity for us to be like creative and bold and to come together in in new formations. Like that is what this moment is calling for. And, and we need to do that, right? As again, the right is very, very clear they are very clear and they're very focused. Like they understand the, that they need to be working together and we need to be doing the same thing. So one is about connecting the dots. Two is again, and I appreciate this, it is about getting political. I, I agree with you, it doesn't have to be partisan. It is about power, right? I think um, I just heard Jane Fonda speak and she said something which I loved, which was, if you can't change the people, change the people, right? <laughs> <laughs> which I loved. It's not the only thing, but we have to change the people. I think that is very, very clear. Um, and the last, I think is just, I think it is about scale. Because as you said, Keisha, we have the urgent and we have the long term. We have both at the exact same time. And we need to be operating at the scale of the problem. We need to be operating commensurate with the enormous threats 
the threats of authoritarianism, the threat of white Christian nationalism, like these are the threats. We have to be as strong as we possibly can. And that means, that means scale, right? That means big. That means a lot of resources. That and it means not being afraid. That means not thinking small. That means not micro credit, but macro credit, right? That means like all the biggest things and the biggest ways possible. So um, those would be my three, my three. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so when I started this work in 2017 in a very unexpected way, uh, I came into uh, my position with $17,000 in the bank. Uh, in 2017, I don't know if you all remember, but Texas was uh, beginning, you know, pioneering what a bathroom bill fight looked like. Uh, in understanding that, and I think really tying back to these values that we come back and say, what does it look like to truly center, understand uh, the folks who um, are really in the, in the crosshairs of that? Uh, and, and how do we make sure that um, what we're doing uh, is actually led, is, is visioned and supported? Um, by us. Uh, I've been extraordinarily lucky uh, to be able to build the organization that we have, uh, but it's also terrifying for me to realize we are the largest um, of our kind in this nation. We did it kind of by just a miracle, uh, and, you know, we did it because uh, my now wife, right, with her political science degree and her deep experience of organizing, who was not my wife at the time, so let me tell you about allyship, uh, <laughs> uh, came in and worked for free up until a couple of years ago. Um, and understanding, you know, uh, here she was, uh, we were doing Instacart, uh, I refer to it as the mayonnaise sandwich uh, era of our life, of building tent. Um, and, and really the reality, I think, and why I'm framing this out for funders is to understand this is what we're up against. When we're talking about scale, when we're talking about what do these pieces look like to really envision and then manifest into reality, uh, where can, and, and to me, where I look at uh, some of our best collaborators have not been LGBTQ organizations. They've been abortion orgs. And, uh, you know, when I came in, I said to my board, hey, we're going to talk about abortion. And we're going to talk about anti-blackness. And we're going to talk about the fact that transphobia literally is a symptom of white supremacy. <laughs> Well, the board walked out. <laughs> they did, except for three. <laughs> three who stayed around to keep us legal, shout out. Uh, but really, like, understanding, right, uh, this upending. In 2017, I was like, we can't say abortion, but we're a trans org? What is going on? A and so really, I think that understanding of what parity looks like at this point in the fight that we're in, we see it spreading across the nation in a horrific way. Uh, and then the other part, I think, is something that I'm gonna charge you all, hopefully, with doing. And that's simply having one conversation in the next month about trans issues with somebody. Because you having that conversation versus me having that conversation is much different. And understanding that sometimes, you know, there, there's only so much money can fix, let's be real. And that shift, what we're looking for in creating a permanence of change, not just for trans folks, for disabled folks, for black people, 
for people of generational poverty, all of these things, right? It comes down to people who have the privilege, who have the agency, the ability to talk to their networks, have those conversations, be able to show up in that way. Because the more conversations we can have in the state of misinformation that we're in, that is going to be an enormous point of power that I don't think that we are really stepping into in, in the depth that we could. And I get it, because at this point, we're all scared of like, what's going to come out of this person's like mouth next? I, I feel like I see that panic when people look at me and have a conversation. I'm like, I get it, I get it, but don't worry, just give me a chance. Uh, especially when I have the cowboy hat on. But it's really just that those two things of funding, understanding what are we up against, uh, understanding that yes, we're in crisis, but I can't run an organization and build sustainability into it for the long term. That is a long fight with a just an emergency response kind of funding structure because everything is an emergency right now. So really encourage you all. I hope you really do have those conversations. Um, and thank you all so much. Um, so three things. Um, if you don't have facility to do rapid response yourself, figure out what your relationships are going to be to be able to do rapid response within the context of your strategies. Secondly, um, for your long-term strategies, if you don't leave here without connecting with someone who would be additive to your strategy that you don't know now. How can we be in partnership? How can we be in community? How can we be in relationship? And I think we can do that today. And um, I think the third thing is um, an admonition to expand our own thinking. How do we think about differently? If you haven't read a book on anti-blackness, read one. If you haven't read a book on futurism, read it. Pick something that helps you think about and understand the structures and spaces where we operate a little bit more, a little bit more effectively, a little bit faster. Um, I don't know another way to do it. There's so much good stuff out there. And the fact is, we may have a lot of problems with the internet, but not one of them is a lack of information. And so... <laughs> really taking advantage. I know how hard it is to do what we have to do every single day, but it is also our obligation to expand and stretch ourselves within these spaces. To be wrong, I've been wrong before. I admit it. Do not tell my wife I said that out loud. <laughs> and, and I want to be wrong more. And I can only do that by learning and listening and being in touch and being in community. So let's be a little more wrong. Let's learn a lot and let's do it in relationship and community. I cannot imagine a better way to close. Please join me in thanking our incredible panelists. And thank y'all so much for taking this time. <laughs>